committee to order. Um, I'm just gonna give the media services a second to pull the logos off the screen. There we go, perfect. All right, so while we're waiting for a few more folks to join us, um, we, I was going to get us started. Um, today we have presentations from our, two of our Right Track interns. They have been, our one Right Track intern, one in, summer intern. Um, and we have um, presentations as has, has I, I think they say after you do it two times, it becomes the tradition. So I'll call it the tradition. Um, an update summarizing their experience here at the St. Paul City Council um, and to share um, the, just basically the takeaways. It's an opportunity for you to shine and, and uh, provide us feedback about the program itself and about, um, you know, well, the real thing is that it provides you an opportunity to have this on videotape and share it with your family. So, <laughs> so we're excited. And so we're today um, with um, now Caitlin, her was in Ward 6, and she's going to go second and summarize her experience and give us a presentation. And Frankie Butner someone was in Ward 5, and she's going to go first. Um, and she is, in addition to giving us a, a kind of a the summary of the experience here, is going is making a recommendation on a policy. So your presentation is going to be a little bit longer, but it does include some uh, marching orders for the council um, to proceed. So it looks like we've got um, who we're expecting here and a full house, and as I mentioned earlier, five cameras, and we're ready to welcome Ms. Butner on up to the front. Welcome. Sorry. I just get up here. And I was just remarking to um, Jessica Larson Johnston that it has been an absolute pleasure to have Frankie as a member of Ward Five this summer. Somebody who I knew before she joined our group, um, but got an opportunity to really get to know her and what a, um, a smart, um, inspirational, and fun, loving human being that we had join us for this amount of time and we'll really miss you. So welcome, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Well, hello council president, council members. Um, I'm Frankie and I've been the Ward 5 intern this summer and it's been a great experience. I've got to see so many different departments of St. Paul, just did fire um, right along last week, water, and I'm gonna be doing the sewage kind of drain Yes, strain things tomorrow. <laughs> so just a lot of cool things and I've just really enjoyed my experience. Um, and part of it has been, oh, can you guys see my slides? Yes. Okay, cool. So part of it has been researching um, gas powered leaf blowers and specifically, or I guess specifically leaf blowers, but all gas powered lawn equipment, um, which isn't something you really think about, but through my research I've learned a lot about and the effects that it has on our environment um, with the noise and also with just pollution and how many pollutants can come from it. So it's been really interesting and I've got to learn a lot about it. So this is going to be kind of what a ban would look like in St. Paul, why it might be needed and the effects of a ban kind of. Okay, so a brief presentation outline. So first I'll kind of talk about why it would be beneficial to have a ban because of the consequences of noise and environmental concerns, um, who this would affect, um, bans that have already happened within St. Paul. I had the opportunity to talk to people at McAllister College who their landscape crew has already gotten rid of gas um, lawn equipment and within similar cities. And then kind of what would be needed for next steps and different levels of bans from slight bans to very extreme cases. Okay, so the most surprising thing I found through my research is the environmental consequences of um, leaf blowers and lawn gas lawn equipment. So um, gas powered lawn equipment uses a two stroke engine typically, which is gas and oil mixed together, which can emit carbon monoxide, nitrous oxides, carcinogenic hydrocarbons, just things I can't even say, that's how. <laughs> Um, that they are just very harmful pollutants to our environment and one-third of the fuel used is viewed into the air as unburned aerosol so just not good for the air that we breathe um, and this is an interesting statistic I've kept running into throughout my research was 
Two-stroke um, gasoline-powered leaf blowers can burn 6.445 grams of pollution per minute, and a 2011 Ford Raptor huge pickup truck burns 0.27 grams of carbon per minute. So, I mean, that kind of puts it into perspective to scale. And then on top of that, breathing in those things, especially as landscape employees who use this equipment all the time, increases in risk in cancer, asthma, cardiovascular disease. And that I heard um, from people who use this equipment over and over again, so. And then also just the noise. I mean, I know a lot of people complain about the noise and it's just not pleasant. So this is kind of interesting. It puts it into perspective about how loud they really can be. Obviously it's louder than electric. Um, so 80, I'm using decibels as a scale, so I guess it's kind of important to know, like um, talking is 60 decibels, vacuum cleaner is 75. And this information I got from Felipe, um, and I believe he got it from DSI, I think. Um, so gas-powered mowers that are hand-pushed that we typically use are 70 to 80. Riding mowers are 90 to 95. And Toro's most powerfully, powerful battery operated um, is 80. So that's standing or, you know, so that's significantly lower than, like that would be the most commercial used one. And also I wanted to mention, it is important to note that louder noise of gas um, equipment can reflect the larger capacity and the stronger horsepower of the engine. So throughout my research, I wanted to have some guiding questions um, about what a ban would, how it would affect our community and how it would affect the people that use this equipment. So how will manufacturers handle demand for electrical equipment if a ban is in place? What is the performance comparison between gasoline and electricity? How does the productivity differ? How can a ban be equitable given the cost comparison between electric and gas? and how can we incentivize purchasing electric equipment. So the next slide, I have kind of some of the cost comparisons. Um, and these are just leaf blowers because that's kind of what I talked about with most people, but I found with all of the equipment, it's pretty similar numbers. So um, obviously I have the electric and the electric hand blower I have here is what I saw St. Paul Parks and Rec use as their kind of highest performing electric blower that they use commercially in big landscapes. And as you can see, it's $479.99. And um, the air velocity is basically how strong it is. And the air volume at the nozzle is just how wide the nozzle is, so how, how far the range is. And then the right side, you see the gas. Um, it is almost 10 decibels higher, and um, it's basically half the price. Um, and it has around the same air velocity, but it probably is stronger, and you can replace the nozzle. This is the most significant thing I found. Uh, on the left side, you see a battery pack um, backpack, and right now, from my findings, I couldn't find any electric hand blower. So this is just a, a battery. So you would attach the battery to the hand blower, so you'd have to carry both equipment, whereas on the right side, it's just all in one. And as you can see, this is significantly more expensive. Um, but you can use it on multiple like different equipment. And yeah, it's about the same weight, but again, you'd have to carry both. And I also find on the right side, that is most commonly used in our parks and rec when they use, when they need leaf blowers, because it just can handle a lot and it's just all in one. So yeah, so here's some pictures I took when I got to see the facility. Um, uh, I have a picture of the weed whips, which, I found this interesting because these are very similar and on the left side is the electric and on the right is the gas, but they don't look very different. And then I have a picture of what I just showed in the last slide um, laid out. So on the right side is gas and on the left is electric. They are bigger, the gas ones, and they also, since they're an engine, um, they can tend to get really hot. 
So here's three most cited disadvantages of switching from gas to electric that I found. Um, obviously the price difference, which I just kind of showed, the productivity difference, and the charging capability. So um, it was really important for me to talk to McAllister College because they have already switched to electric equipment. Um, and they were able to do this through the alternative landscape grant, grant from the state. So they spent $5,000 and got matched with $10,000 worth of equipment. And I found it interesting that they spent most of their money on batteries. Like, as you saw, that one's $2,000, so. Um, they have not been able to replace their gas sitting mowers that you see, you know, cutting large grass landscapes. And um, it's estimated that would be $30,000 for an electric one because there's just nothing on the market right now. They replace weed witch, chainsaws, push mowers, handheld leaf blowers, um, and they said they're significantly quieter, uh, but again, they haven't found a backpack leaf blower that it's electric. And they said the most equivalent thing they found was the electric chainsaw. So um, on charging capabilities, one battery on the electric handheld blower lasts throughout the entire day. And they stress the convenience of electric equipment, less fumes, and again, it's just not as hot on your back. Um, and they're not breathing in these fumes. So Parks and Rec was really important for me to um, go view what they use and their opinion on this. Um, and they have so many different departments. And I found that electric works for some departments and it really wouldn't work for others. So it just doesn't have the same velocity as a gas leaf blower, the electric one. And um, especially in fall cleanup on sand or in wood chips, it just doesn't have the same capability. And I actually got to hold the electric one and the gas one and the gas actually like push me back versus the electric like I could use, so. Um, they did stress the convenience and it's really up to their employees for preference on which one they use, but they tend to go for gas. It's easier to start, doesn't have a learning curve, and noise, noise is only emitted when you are actively using electric equipment. So it doesn't have a kind of stalling noise. Um, they estimated that they use three batteries um, per equipment and they need to charge the battery three times in one hour versus fueling up one time. Um, they also said it's great for residential use and um, it is dependent on landscape. And I found it interesting they also stressed the equity gap of um, the difference in price and how it would be very large. Um, the price of buying new batteries is just significant and Battery equipment may require more long-term repair and may be more likely to need maintenance. So the next three slides I have kind of um, possible bans that could go into effect and what would be needed to do that. And I also have cities that have done these bans. So I found a lot of cities and towns um, banned leaf blowers that produce a certain um, volume decibel. So if they're already that um, so Palm Beach, Montgomery, Portland, Chapel Hill are just some of the cities I found who have done this. And they, not allow, they don't allow the sale of equipment that produces more than 65 to 70 decibels. So like I said, most gas equipment doesn't produce more, um, produces more than 70 decibels, sorry. Um, I also wanted to say that some cities have banned um, equipment at certain times of the day. So Houston doesn't allow um, certain decibels between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. for the noise. To make this possible, there would definitely need to be some sort of agency or department that could ensure violations um, for fees are, and fees are enforced. It would need to be in multiple years so that residents and commercial landscapers could transition to new equipment. Um, and the sound decibel that is produced by certain equipment needs to be accessible when people are purchasing so they know what is, what is legal and what isn't. So on a little bit more of a moderate change, um, which I didn't find many cities who are like this, and it was also hard to find cities that are equal in size to St. Paul. Um, the closest I found was Washington, D.C., which is just, it's different. So, um, they actually ban banned gas-powered leaf blowers in 2020. 
or 2020, yeah, 2022, sorry. Um, they are subject to fines, but they have incentives to switch by providing subsidies for contractors and households. Um, so, and the equipment that is allowed to, for these subsidies is made by the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, and they also enforce the fees. So again, what would need to happen is there would need to be a department to ensure violations are enforced multiple years. And oh, it's important to note that they voted this into council in 2018. So that's multiple years that residents and commercial landscapers could transition. And what qualifies as subsidized equipment is formed based on industry experts and is public knowledge. So they had a agency that identified what would comply with these regulations. Now on the more extreme level, um, California in 2024 are planning on phasing out all gas equipment, lawn equipment. Um, this is California, so it's a little bit different obviously. <laughs> um, and regulations are declared by California's Air Resource Board, so all sold equipment must have zero emissions by 2024. I also wanted to say that through my research, I found that um, a bill was introduced in the House in this legislative session um, that all, in Minnesota, all lawn and garden equipment must be powered by electricity by January 2025. And this didn't go anywhere, but um, it, ha it has been talked about in the state. Um, and it would make Minnesota the second state to do this. So, Kind of what I've seen California do to make this happen and what would need to happen if this ban were to go in place was formation of a department to determine whether targets are being reached on production of electric equipment. So they are really prioritizing making electric equipment. Um, and if production isn't meeting threshold, they plan to move the target date back. Um, prioritizing increasing production of electric equipment to increase or to e even the price gap. So more electrical equipment, less demand for gas, evens the price gap. And they assume that the upright cost of transition must be offset by money saved in fuel and repairs of gas equipment. And that last thing I found was really interesting because um, throughout my research, I found, especially at Parks and Rec, they said um, switching to electric would be, it's kind of comparable to switching to an electric car. It's obviously a lot more expensive, and it might have repairs, and the technology isn't there where it can be mainstream, but hopefully in the future it would be a worthy investment. So in order for all these things to kind of come to fruition, next steps, I said there would need to be for more concrete, local, and accurate data to best reflect the motivations for a potential ban. Um, I have, in my talkings with Matt Kalster, they have said that they are very interested in doing some sort of class lab through their sustainability classes that could find um, data that's local and accurate because a lot of this data is very extreme and who knows when it was tested and how accurate it is. And hopefully this data could increase awareness of the negative effects of gas powered equipment to incentivize people buying electric. And obviously technology needs to increase in electric equipment to meet the productivity of gas-powered equipment and help even the price gap. And so my last slide is, any questions? Thank you, I'll let, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for looking into that too. I, when, um, as you've seen, we're, you, the list of obligations for council offices is huge, and to have something like this as an issue of interest, but not the capacity to look into it is something that really, I think, slows down our work. So I appreciate the time that you put into this, and, and I will also just say, um, we often talk about how there's a, uh, untapped potential to partner with our local colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. And the idea of partnering with McAllister, who's already done some of this converting, to create a data record so that we can quantify what we're doing and why um, is genius. That's a great idea. And um, so I really appreciate that because it feels like when you head back to Dublin, um, this project will not sit in a dusty binder, but it is going to continue to move forward. And we appreciate that. And I will also just tell my colleagues that um, we would have brought this to, to the CJAB 
uh, before Frankie left, but we couldn't get on their schedule, so I'm gonna bring her information to the CJAB in September to talk about um, the findings and and, um, and next steps. So I think in, in addition to the work of McAllister, we'll look at CJAB, but we're noticing more, um, in our, at least in Ward 5, we've noticed more complaints about the use of leaf blowers for snow removal, leaf blowers for roofing jobs, leaf blowers, and, and I think that in addition to it being allowed and uh, quality of life issue, as you mentioned, the contractors who use them um, are also subject to the pollution and to the noise, and, and we're concerned about that as well. And it sounds like there's momentum across the country to make some changes, so thanks for doing the heavy lifting and teeing this up for us. Yes. Um, Ms. Nicker. Thanks, Council President. Mm -hmm. That was a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. I echo everything the Council President said. I, I really am feel lucky to have gotten to hear, hear you. Um, this is definitely an issue that my constituents have brought up to me multiple times, and to be honest, my office has been stymied in trying to figure out how to overcome some of the barriers that you mentioned. I really appreciated the way that you presented the information so objectively. You really clearly thought through um, the pros and cons, the phase-ins, the incentives versus penalties, all of the things that I think we think about and talk about on this table all the time. So I am um, really glad to have this information, and I'm, I'm glad that the Council President is moving this forward, and we'll look forward to hearing how we can how we can take this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prince. Yeah, I, I ditto uh, what my colleagues have said, and it is, it's something that came up in my first year, eight years ago on the council, so I'm really glad that we have this information. And the most incredible number that you gave us to me that I wrote down was that a third of the fuel is spewed into the air as, as unburned fuel. Like what kind of product wastes a third of its fuel? when fuel is so expensive. It's, that was just really alarming. But I, I got a bunch of great notes and thank you and I'm delighted that we'll go to the CJAP with it. Yeah, and it, and it was also interesting to learn that the state legislature is starting to look at this yeah. and, and while it didn't move far, um, St. Paul is often a leader in these um, initiatives and the state will follow our lead if we can make yeah. Other thoughts, Ms. Yang? Thank you. I wanted to say thank you so much for all the research that you put into this. Um, and uh, also thank you to you and Frankie, you and Caitlin for even taking on the role of being our right track interns. I think it's such an incredible pipeline for you all and also our former interns to go into. I hope that all of you will one day return to work here in the council office or even be here in our seats too as council members in the future. Um, and. Um, about the presentation, I just want to say I loved the um, information you shared about what other states have done, other cities have done. Like those are um, just, I, I feel like, normal questions that I always bring up whenever I'm curious more about a new topic um, that I'm pursuing or even, you know, that other council members are, are wanting to learn more about too. And then um, the, the ways that you listed, like pros and cons and even comparisons and like the cost of electric equipment, it definitely is more expensive. Um, and I, I hope that you know, we get to a point where it's normalized and it is the standard and that the price of it will come down so that even you know, families who are low income or just struggling financially, they can also afford it too because it truly is an investment that they're making into you know, their, their household, also into the community and environmentally too. So I, I love what you shared. And, it would definitely, this would be like a policy that I would love to see happen. And I also know that there are many envir environmental justice organizations who would be so excited to <laughs> talk more about this too. So thank you yeah. for your work on it. Thank you. Thank you. Other thoughts? Mr. Tober. I'll just add, uh, similar to my colleagues, first of all, great presentation, thank you. Um, this is also an issue that I've gotten a fair amount of emails over the years on, and it uh, just was one where we weren't quite sure what to do with it, and this really puts everything into a nice context and makes, in my opinion, the, the what to do with it pretty simple. <laughs> so thank you for that uh, and working on it. I think it is something that would have legs at the council um, if the proposal is brought forward. So thank you for initiating this and educating us on it. And good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you, Council President and Council Members. Thank you very much. Deciding to finish a, a summer internship and have a policy that will that we will continue to advance, yes. and someday you can be like, I did that. <laughs> That'll be great. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. All right, Miss Caitlin. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome. Thank you. Let me plug this in. All right, so you plug, you've plugged in the screen? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. It's all poison. Well, hello, Council President and Council Members. Um, my name is Caitlin Herr, and I am the 2023 Bright Track Summer Intern for the City of St. Paul Council of Ward 6. So, a little bit about me. I've been with Bright Track every summer since 2019, <laughs> which makes this my fifth year in Bright Track. And I'm so happy to be back, but I don't think I would do another year as, <laughs> <laughs> as I've been here for a very long time. Um, I am a recent graduate from Harding High School, and I will be attending the U of M in the fall, um, majoring in biology. And the reason I've chosen this internship was out of interest after my social study classes indulged me in topics like the racial wealth gap and housing inequities. I'm also very into learning about social injustices and advocacy, so I was hoping to learn more about some of that during my time here. So being here this summer has given me the opportunity to learn a lot, like developing professional writing skills outside of typical five paragraph essays and finding the right resources that are relevant and up to date. And I've had the opportunity last week to sit in a rent stabilization appeal hearing and it was surprisingly very interesting. Um, but this summer wasn't just about work. I've also got to see multiple parts of the city and what it has to offer. So as you can see here, we've toured the fire station, the St. Paul Regional Water Services, the Como Zoo, where I got to feed a giraffe. Oh. And I've gotten to volunteer with Habitat for Humanity for a women's build, and I got to put up drywall on the walls and stuff like that. <laughs> and I went on my very first paddle boat ride for um, a celebration with the Awakenings program. And when I first got here, I got to attend the, the Heights event where I learned about the collective efforts of multiple services working together. And in all of these experiences, there's no doubt that they're all so different. Yet one thing that they share together is that all the people behind it have so much passion for their work and what they do, which it, which I love to see that. <laughs> and in all of my years of right track, I've never seen people so satisfied with their careers and what they're doing. And I've never engaged with my coworkers so closely either. So you'd be surprised about how many people here went to the U of M and have offered me advice and support in that area. <laughs> and also a big thanks to Ward 6 for always being so warm and welcoming, especially JLOR, who has been essentially raising me this summer <laughs> into becoming more independent. <laughs> So overall, I had a great internship experience this summer, and I'm happy to introduce you to my main project of the summer. So today I'll be talking about the misclassification of the Hmong ethnic group in the 2020 census data products. So in June, the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center, also known as CRAC, brought up the issue to our office. In the 2020 census data products, the U.S. Census Bureau has misclassified the Hmong as East Asian instead of Southeast Asian. So I was tasked to draft a letter to the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders to express concern and urge for reclassification. But first, I needed to dive more into where exactly the issue is present and why this mis misclassification is not only incorrect but also harmful to the Hmong community. So in January, the the U.S. Census Bureau released their 2020 demographic and housing characteristics proof of concept for public feedback before releasing an official one in September. And if you look down in the Hispanic origin and race code list, as you can see here, the Hmong has been categorized under the East Asian regional group. This isn't the only time this has happened, but it's also happened in the 2020 Census State Redistricting Summary File that has made the exact same classification. So, what's the big deal? Didn't the Hmong originate from southern China? Well, sure, but this classification isn't very representative of the Hmong Americans that have come to the United States. 
which to the majority of them have come from South, Southeast countries like Thailand and Laos and Vietnam. And since the Hmong aren't tied to a country, it, they simply imply that we're from East Asia. Our social political identity eventually started to align with Southeast Asians due to our involvement with the secret war in the Vietnam War. We've begun to share similar experiences like living in the refugee camps and healing from violent trauma individually and as a community. It is so much more than just adding the word South. It's acknowledging the differences and disparities of our communities. These kinds of files are important in representing the diversity of our population for institutions to reference, which is why it is crucial that it is, that it is as accurate as it can be, including making the reclassification. So what has been done about it so far? CRAC, along with other Hmong and Asian American organizations have been working hard to urge census to make the change. The team has sent letters to census about why this misclassification is harmful and needs to be corrected. Alongside possible solutions like proposing more engagement with Hmong communities and having more conversations to get better understandings. And they also like, provided solutions like just adding an arrestic Ristic statements. They've also been reaching out to other Hmong communities and Hmong leaders to bring more awareness about the situation and call for more support in their initiatives, like what has happened to us. And it doesn't stop there. They've been reaching out through social media to educate people on the matter and, spare, and spread awareness in the community. Here are just a few examples of Facebook posts from Freedom Inc. expressing their concerns. And here you can see Hua talks about the need for acknowledgement. Caleb mentions the hardship of trying to not get erased. And Cam brings up the possibility of being misrepresented. So all in all, my letter was written with three main points. Oh, I was supposed to pass it out, actually. <laughs> Thank you. So all in all, my letter was written with three main points. One, that the Hmong have, been collective, have collectively identified themselves as Southeast Asian based on their experiences. Two, the misclassification may skew future research and provide inaccurate information in important documents. And lastly, that correction must be done as soon as possible to prevent misclassification from spreading further. We'll also be urging other Hmong organizations to write their letters in support like the Hmong Archives, Southeast, wait, sorry, <laughs> East Side Freedom Library, and Hmong Cultural Clubs at local colleges. So I urge you to read this letter as we'll be entering a resolution to submit and make this correction to the White House. We ask for your support in this initiative, and if you'd be willing to sponsor, we'd be grateful. So that concludes my presentation, and thank you for your time. Have any questions? Ms. Yang. Oh. No, go right away. Well, Caitlin, thank you so much for your work in our office and spending so many weeks working on this letter. I know it, it took so much work and research and also a community building too with many of the organizations that reached out to us. Um, and I, again, want to say thank you for being a, a right track intern in our office. It was such a joy to have you um, as a part of our team. I also want to give a shout out to our Ward 16 too, Jaylor, Jenna, <laughs> Council Assistant Max. You all made um, our council office and just the, just the council as a whole so welcoming to Caitlin, to all of our interns. And I also want to extend a thank you to every single person here um, for being a part of that too. And this, this is a, a really important letter, a really important issue. St. Paul is the urban city with the densest population of Hmong people. And so this is something that we have a huge stake in. We, you know, in government work are always relying on data to inform us on what we need to do in order to solve the everyday issues that community members are facing. And the census is a, an important you know, report that we are always tapping back into and pulling data from. And as you all know, it's also how funding, it's 
is decided to for for you know all across the country and so it's important for communities to be reflected in it and also to be classified correctly um, so that you know for for the communities with higher needs they also get what they need in order to be able to live dignified lives um, and so I am really invested in this and will be um, really excited to turn this into a resolution so we can have the council be um, in, in to, to vote in support of it and I would make a big ask for our council members to also be supportive of their resolution too when it comes to in front of us. Yeah, and I was gonna say like, you had me at a hello. We're definitely <laughs> gonna sign this, but any time that you, it, it is wonderful to really get the in-depth look of like what, so why does, um, you know, attaching your name to this matter? Why does it matter to you as an individual? Why does it matter in terms of funding and resourcing? So it just, it's, I wish that we had the time and capacity to really get a deep dive into all of this work, but it was, it's really great. Um, because I feel like like I'm full fully and um, on board and want to support you and this work and Ms. Yang and, and moving this forward. So I appreciate that, um, Ms. Jalali, then Ms. Prince. Thank you. I also just wanted to um, echo the well-deserved appreciation for your work, Caitlin. Um, I have a special um, personal connection to this work and just seeing the value as the. Um, co-chair of the Ramsey County 2020 census effort with all of our colleagues, all our community partners, and we talked for two years leading up to the census and during the census about how counting everyone accurately is a, the equivalent of billions of federal dollars in funds to the point Councilmember Yang was making that get allocated based on um, our ability to make sure everyone is counted and that they're accurately uh, uh, characterized and, and categorized. And, you know, within the um, complexity of the Asian American people group. There are so many subgroups, and in my years working with AAPI advocate groups, one of the top things that has been fought for is data disaggregation. Because if you're not actually disaggregating for the many, many, many people, ethnicities, nationalities, cultures within the AAPI category, there's huge income disparities, huge uh, different disparities in access to things like educational and employment opportunity, housing, everything. So. This is just tremendously important work, and I'm so impressed and grateful to you. Um, also, as a fellow um, different census category that isn't being counted accurately um, in the, in the of the Iranian American heritage, that is also um, a thing that my community experiences in the Middle Eastern part of the boxes to check. It's a whole situation. So I just appreciate um, your intelligence, your curiosity, and also just um, the many staff that have supported you in your years at the city. Um, well done on a great outcome, and I'm very happy to support your office's work. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Prince, then Mr. Bellinger. Um, yeah, Caitlin, I, the question that I have, and I agree with everybody that it was a really good presentation, and it's been great to have you here, but I wondered, is this the first time that the census did this? Had it, um, do you know in 2010 if, if it was this yeah, way as so well? Yes, so some of this, like the reclassification is based off um, documents from 2010, and then they like kind of push it further to the 2020, if that makes sense. So like the redistricting files, all of that information has come from the 2010. Uh -huh. So then that's what that information is based off of. And it has, so this has been ongoing. Yes. Okay, thank you. This really important work. <laughs> Mr. Ballinger. I just wanted to say great work and a great presentation. Thank you. Mr. Tolbert. Yeah, I just uh, echo what my colleagues say, and I'll, I'll just say, if you would have come up here and told us that you just graduated from the University of Minnesota, I would have believed <laughs> it based on that presentation, because that is uh, graduate level presentation, graduate school level presentation, so awesome work. I learned a lot from it, and uh, I think it's really important that we all learn from it and, and support it going forward, and best of luck to you um, in, in your future endeavors as a biology major, maybe med school or wherever you're gonna go. But I'm sure you'll do amazing wherever you do based on this. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your the time and effort. And we're gonna miss you when you're gone. When does school start? Uh, school starts after Labor Day, but tomorrow is my last day here. Oh. <laughs> no, five years and one more day. So thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your efforts and we appreciate your presentation. As Mr. Tolbert said, um, the U of M is going to be accepting a big, bright, shining star. So we're looking forward to hearing where your path leads you. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right.
Yes, and this is a reminder how um, it, wonderful it is to have interns, right track interns in the summer. Um, I know that for some of us as a, at a campaign year, it's difficult to, to bring on board um, interns, but um, next year there's an opportunity again. And um, I think we've seen that these policy projects in addition to getting to explore the city departments and the city council, um, really add another layer of, um, of purpose to the role. And we just really appreciate both of the um, projects and presentations because they're actionable and things that we support and are interested in and in being more involved in. So thank you. I um, encourage people to continue to engage um, the Right Track program and intern program in the future. And we're just, before we leave, would look, I'm just asking this of all of our council staff and the interns and the Right Track um, team that's here, if we could just do a quick photo, um, we would appreciate that. All right, we are adjourned.